All right, so it's a pleasure for me to be back. Um, I wanted to give you an update. That's one of the first things I wanted to do. Last time I was here, exciting things happen when you come to Congregation Beth Shalom. Uh, the following day uh, from my presentation last time, my wife gave birth to a beautiful and very hungry baby boy. Uh, his name is uh, Yonadav Amiel. So there's no distinct, there's no, not going to be any confusion about wh where he's coming from. Yeah. Um, but uh, my wife had some complications. She was uh, in the ICU, some high blood pressure issues after the fact. Uh, it was very scary for us, but Baruch Hashem, she uh, is at home recovering. And uh, we have three, three boys, three musketeers now. So um, in any case, uh, and uh, it was a very uh, emotional time, as you can imagine. So the Second Temple era is, without question, one of the most fascinating aspects of Jewish history, at least as, as far as I'm concerned. And the reason for that, in part, is because I think that in many ways it reflects the complexity of Jewish life that we find in the 21st century. Um, many of the things that we take for granted today were actually determined and established within the Second Temple era. So I'll begin just with three examples, and then we'll dive in, and then we'll sort of go back and forth in terms of some of these examples. Uh, the first thing is uh, very obvious matrilineal descent. Of course, until, until the 1980s, uh, when the Reform Movement adopted patrilineal descent as a, as a valid uh, pointer of, of Jewish identity, um, all Jewish movements recognized matrilineal descent as, as a halachic standard. Um, and this uh, was established during the Second Temple period, as we find in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, which we'll talk about in, in briefly. Uh, the second issue, which I think is, is clear, is the importance of the written Torah. Before that time, even though the temple existed in Jerusalem, uh, most of instruction was dedicated or was uh, in the hands of the priest and, and the, Le the Levites. Uh, when Ezra and Nehemiah return from the Babylonian captivity in 458, they bring a physical Torah scroll with them, and the, the, the Tanakh, the scripture tells us that they had a bima, and they read from the bima, and they gave a preliminary uh, bracha, they, they gave a, a blessing as they were reading the Torah on Rosh Hashanah. The people heard the entire reading of the Torah, and that, of course, continues on to today with every Jewish movement, regardless of their uh, theological views. Uh, continuing with the primacy of the Torah as, as a sacred text. And that also extends to all of the Tanakh. Uh, eventually, of course, all of the, the writings from the prophets and so forth would be included. Um, and we take it for granted today that sacred writings were available to people. Uh, they were not. Uh, it was something that was very selective. But after Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, we see the beginning uh, uh, just, you know, uh, spread of, of sacred texts in the hands of, of small communities. Um, the last thing that I would say is uh, the issue of halakha. The, uh, the book of Nehemiah and Ezra talk about Ezra reading the Torah, and then it says that the, uh, the Levites gave explanation, right, so the people would understand. So when you read a text and you explain it, you have to provide context for it. How do you carry out the mitzvot? How do you carry out the, the, the commandments? And that process of reading and interpretation produces what? It produces potential conflict. Because I read the text one way, and I have a tradition that says it should be kept one way, while another group says, well, I have a tradition that says it should be kept this way. And so what we have is we have the growth of sectarian conflict, which today in the 21st century we call denominational differences. So uh, nothing is new under the sun, uh, but we'll go ahead and dive in. So that is sort of the prelude. Uh, this is actually like a five or six hour class. We're only going to get to like 10 slides, so don't worry. Um, but this sort of explains what I just said, that I, I really think that the Second Temple period is critical uh, to understanding Jewish life in the 21st century. I remember back in 2006, I'll just share this quick story, when the, um, the chief rabbinate disqualified, I think about talked about this before, 40,000 conversions in the state of Israel, this whole issue of who is a Jew was coming up. Well, that issue was an issue that came up in the Second Temple period, as we will see, most uh, poignantly in the case of the Samaritans, of, of the, uh, the, northern, the remnants of the northern tribes that were uh, still there in some form or fashion, but had been um, assimilated or had adopted individuals from other places as well, uh, along with their religious practices. So we'll uh, continue. So what we want to do first is we want to establish some very uh, general dates. We're skipping a lot of information because there's just no time to, to, uh, to cover that. The first thing, of course, is to give us reference is the United Monarchy uh, that began with Shaul, with, with Saul, continue with David, his son Solomon, and then his grandson Rehoboam. Now, under Rehoboam, you will remember that uh, the northern tribes rebel, and the argument that they make is that they're under too much taxation and conscripted labor. So uh, if we actually read the biblical text in other places, like in uh, uh, Shoftim and Judges, we will find that this inter-tribal problems are very common. 
You remember the story of Deborah and Barak when they're fighting Balak? Uh, Deborah calls out the tribes, and at the end, when they have victory, she composes a song of victory, the Song of Deborah. Uh, but if you read the Song of Deborah, she only mentions certain tribes. Why? Because the rest of them didn't show up. Now, in another case, in, in Shoftim, we have Gideon. And you remember in that case, according to the story, Hashem tells Gideon, you've got too many people, reduce your forces down until eventually he only has like 300 people, uh, 300 men. And then they attack, uh, well, the Midianites are thrown into despair. They attack each other. Uh, they run and Gideon goes after them with his band of 300 men. And then other tribes become angry because why? Because they didn't get to pay, uh, partake of the spoil. And they're like, how come you didn't tell us? So when it's convenient, you know, don't bother me. And when it's convenient, you better include me. How dare you not invite me? Um, so, <laughs> so this issue comes up, and of course there's a separation. And if we could go forward one slide, and then we'll go back. We have a lot of back and forth here. So this is just a review. This is the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. They're very tiny, as you can see. Um, and the critical thing that we have to take away from this is that, um, you know, to the southwest we have uh, Egypt, um, and of course we have the kingdom of Ammon and Moab, which are uh, mentioned in the Bible. Uh, but further to the to the northeast and, of course, farther east, we have the growing threats that we'll face in a second, which are the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. And, of course, later the Persian Empire and so forth. So that just gives you sort of a little map there to see what we're dealing with. And then we, we can go back. What countries would be contemporary today and might help? If so contemporary, uh, if, if we look to the east, if we go back to the to east, of course, this is... Uh, Modern day uh, Jordan, uh, and of course this would be part of uh, Syria and the Lebanon. And then as you extend farther east, you're going to hit parts of Iraq. And then of course the Persian Empire encompassed Iraq and uh, Persia and, and so forth. And eventually even conquered Egypt and, and so forth. Um, Thank you. And then uh, we continue. Um, now, if you read the book of Chronicles and the book of Kings, you'll find that Assyrian Empire, the Assyrian Empire grew. Uh, and made several incursions into the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom was a vassal state. So they were independent to the extent that they could govern themselves, but they had to pay tribute to uh, the Assyrian uh, emperors. So if we could skip over to, um, I'm trying to find a way to do this easier, but it's not uh, simple. So here we have something called the Black Obelisk. Uh, this is uh, King Jehu. You may remember him from the Bible. He's famous because Elisha Hanavi, Elisha anointed him. And he kills, or he has uh, Jezebel, uh, King Ahab's wife, killed. Uh, the last of that tribe, or the last of that line is ended. And here, uh, Jehu is actually uh, sort of a good king in, in that sense, because he does worship Hashem. But the problem, according to the biblical text, is that he leaves, I believe, the two, uh, the two uh, bulls in, in, uh, that people served, you know, that worshipped in the northern kingdom. Uh, I think he did that for political reasons, but in any case, the Bible frowns upon that. And here we have King Jehu uh, submitting before Shalmaneser as a vassal king. So this is something historic. I'm always amazed why people question the um, antiquity of, of Israel. I know there are many archaeologists that throw a lot of questions about that, but I'm always amazed when you find things like this that are not from a Jewish standpoint. They're from the particular kingdoms in question that verify the existence of, of ancient Israel. So we'll go back uh, to the... Yeah. Oh, this is, well, this is good. Just uh, We can show that. This is a, 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 a Syrian exiles. They're not uh, from northern Israel, but they're across um, uh, the city of Ashtartu, which is in modern Jordan. So you can sort of take this image and think uh, it's contemporary with the um, captivity of the northern kingdom. So you have sort of an image of what that may have looked like. So we'll go back up. Uh, yeah, one more. I'm sorry. Back to the dates. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. All right. So. Uh, so if you read, just, just for information's sake, if you read the book of Chronicles and you read the book of Kings, there's a little bit of a uh, difference between the two accounts. Because what happens is most people, of course, uh, link the lost tribes to this particular era. Uh, and to some extent that's true, but if you read the text a little bit more carefully, you'll find that the incursions by the Assyrians take place in phases. And usually what they would do is they would take the higher echelons of society. So they want to take the priests, they want to take the king, they want to take the nobility, they want to take the major landowners. And as you read, the biblical text will always say, and only the poorest of the land remained. Well, of course, the trick to remember is that everybody was poor, right? So the majority of the people remained. Um, and in specific text, if you look at the differences between Chronicles and Kings, you'll find that uh, one account, I believe it's Chronicles, will tell you that only the tribe of Reuben 
Gad and uh, Manasseh, or Manasseh, uh, were taken. So we have sort of a disparity between those texts. We also find that the southern kingdom of Judah was making overtures to the remnants of the tribes in the north. So King Hezekiah, for example, invites people to come to the south to participate in Pesach, to participate in Passover. And eventually, when Ezra and Nehemiah return, uh, which we'll see down in just a couple of lines, they sacrifice on behalf of all of Israel, of Kalal Yisrael, which I believe is a uh, uh, reflection of the fact that tribal remnants remained in uh, the, tr- uh, the kingdom of Judah, uh, or the, the, the province of Judah at that time. So that tribal affiliation was not completely lost. Now, I'll appeal uh, to um, what might seem to be um, an odd text, and that's actually the New Testament. If you read the New Testament from a historical standpoint, you'll find that there are references to, I believe, the tribe of Asher, and of course the tribe of Benjamin. Now, that's in the Second Temple period, so it seems completely legitimate, at least from a historical standpoint, that people may have maintained records up to that time. So some people could affiliate themselves with a particular tribe, even until the, uh, the first century. So we continue. Um, of course, eventually, uh, the Northern Kingdom is completely destroyed as a political entity in 722 BCE. Uh, the kingdom of Judah survives that. There's a story about Sennacherib, who tries to conquer Jerusalem with King uh, Hezekiah. Um, they continue to exist uh, as an independent kingdom until 586 BCE. The Babylonians came and they made uh, Judah a vassal state. Uh, they took Yehoachin or Jeconiah. Uh, they took him back as a, as a captive, but he was allowed to sit at the king's table, at Nebuchadnezzar's table. And the scripture tells us that he was given uh, an allowance. He sat at his table for as long as he lived. So that was always sort of a, an interesting relationship that would come about. You know, you, you've rebelled, but I'm going to take you and I'll, I'll sort of uh, honor your status. Eventually, under Zedekiah, uh, the kingdom uh, rebels. The kingdom of Judah rebels. That's uh, put down. The temple is destroyed. And then, of course, captives are taken once again into Babylon. Um, the decree of Cyrus uh, happens in 515. Now, we don't know exactly because there's always a little bit of leeway, 528, 520, 515. Eventually, um, this is what, of course, the, the prophet Jeremiah spoke of, that eventually Hashem would return the captives of uh, Zion back to the land of Judah. And so what we find is, is if we can go, I think, four slides. Um, yeah, two, three, one more. What we have is this is called the decree of Cyrus. It's the cylinder of Cyrus. So this is in cuneiform. Anybody can read that. You get $100 off the spot. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> So if you go one down, I think, yeah, I think we have the decree itself. So basically, I'm not going to read it, but you can look at it here. What he basically says is that his policy is going to be different than the policy of the Assyrians. The Assyrians would do this. They would take a population group from one place that they conquered. They would transfer it to another place, and they would take that place that they had conquered, take people, and put them all over. And the goal in their minds was to disassociate the nobility the landowners from the areas that they would be strong in so that they would not have rebellion on their hands. When you think about it, it sort of makes sense, right? Uh, from the perspective of Cyrus, they have a different ap- approach. They believe that if we allow people to return to their original places of origin, if we support the local cults, the religions, the, the temples of these people, they will actually be loyal to us. And in fact, what we'll do to sort of step up the game We will empower these individual groups with imperial authority, that is to say with soldiers, to make sure that the populace is adhering to the religion and the laws of that particular land. So it's very progressive, I think you could say, in in many ways. Um, We have a a second Chronicles, and there's actually another, I think in Ezra repeats this, where they put it in in reference in terms of the children of Israel. So uh, in the in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the word of the Lord, the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the, st- the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put in also in writing, saying, um, and I'll skip down, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord, the God of heaven, given to me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whosoever there is among you uh, of all his people, the Lord his God will be with him. Let him go up. So there's imperial um, permission to return from Babylon back to Judah and rebuild the temple. So now if we can go back four slides. Sorry for the gymnastics there. Yes. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were not contemporaries, were they? I thought Nehemiah followed 50 years or so after Ezra. 
Um, I think there's a 13-year disparity between the two. I think what happens is we confuse, uh, and it happens to be two. What happens is when the decree is first given, um, you, you remember Gedalia and Zerubbabel, right? Gedalia, we do the fast of Gedalia after Rosh Hashanah. So he's appointed as a governor. And Zerubbabel is a skion of David. He's from the house of David. And there's a debate among scholars as to whether he was actually called king, uh, as a vassal king. So Gedali comes back, he's murdered. Uh, Zerubbabel comes with uh, uh, Yeshua or Yehoshua, the, the high priest, depending on, uh, it's different in uh, Zechariah versus, uh, I think, Ezra. There's a different, uh, you know, one uses the Aramaic version and the Hebrew version. Um, but what happens under Ezra and Nehemiah, they come back basically, um, what is it, 60, 70 years later. Right. So the initial rave of returnees is very small. Uh, because they come back in the 515, somewhere in that era. Uh, and then in 458, Ezra as a scribe of the Torah and Nehemiah as the cupbearer, who is now the governor, they come back to a temple that is operating, but Jerusalem is still in ruins. They're going to rebuild the walls, right? So we do have a disparity because Ezra sort of there first, and there's, some dif- there's a difference in the text that, that sort of look a little bit complicated. So but, they knew each other then? Uh, according to the text, yes. Yeah, so they knew each other, at least according to, to uh, the text that we have. Um, and they begin a, a new era in Judah, and I would say a new era in Judaism. Why? Because remember that they have imperial authority to mandate that the Torah will be kept in accordance with the dictates of the Torah that they have established. Now, what's key to remember is that um, I think what we'll do is this. I'll, I'll go through this, and then I'm going to get to the central slide, uh, make it easier. So let's skip it. We'll, we'll go back to 458. So just to give you some context, uh, remember you have the, uh, the Persian Empire, and the Persian Empire is eventually conquered by Alexander the Great, uh, and we have the context for that, 332 BCE. Eventually that is splintered, right, because he doesn't have any uh, sons, so it's splintered into four different camps. And, uh, of course, here we have the rise of the Ptolemaic Kingdom and the Seleucid Kingdom, which, of course, is where the, the story of Hanukkah uh, comes in. So the Maccabean War, actually, this is always something that people forget, that it's a 25-year endeavor, right? It's 167, 142. The capture of Jerusalem, the restoration of the temple is only one element of that. It's, it's only in the beginning. Um, and then eventually we have, if we, if we go forward, of course, we have an independent Jewish kingdom that exists until 63 BCE uh, when the Romans come. And then eventually the, Roman, the, the Romans destroy the temple in, in 70 CE. So now we're going to move forward and put uh, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and all these things in context. We're down another one. And we'll go down. We'll skip a few slides, actually. Go further down. One, what is, you know, my history is left. Yeah. What is CE or BCE and uh, CE? Yeah, so, so BC is, is the, uh, the standard that was used before Christ. So it was always from a Christian uh, standpoint. And scholars use that until... Uh, it's, that's before the Common Era. So scholars nowadays, to be less uh, biased, if you will, uh, to be more neutral, they will use CE, the Common Era, is zero, forward, and BCE is before. If you say BC and AD, you're accepting Jesus as Savior. So, yeah. okay. right. so, so AD was Anno Domino, yeah. you know, in the year of our Lord. So that was the standard. I mean, and, and, and if, you write, if you look at Jewish writings in the past, they would use those terms as well. I mean, that, you know, yeah, Jews in Great Britain and so forth. But now in you know, the 21st century, 20th century, people use BCE and so forth. Uh, so this is sort of the slide that I wanted to get to because we're not going to be able to cover everything else. Uh, and this will give us the framework that I want to spend most of the time on. So remember that um, Ezra is a priest and he is a descendant of Sadok. Who is Sadok? Sadok was, one of, was the, uh, uh, the high priest that served with King David. And that line of priests that come back with uh, Ezra continues for hundreds of years until the Maccabean War. And it's in that issue, the Maccabees, of course, they're also from a priestly family, but they're not entitled to the high priesthood. Uh, they, what they do is they displace the uh, Zadokite line, and that displacement causes a rift. And so what we have here, and, and this is sort of a little bit complicated, and, and of course this is scholarly... Uh, this is a scholarly, scholarly attempt to summarize what are very complex issues. So I'm not telling you this is 100% the way it is, but this is a way that we simplify things to try to explain these issues. So nobody went around and said, hey, I'm a Zadokite Jew. You know, they didn't say that. But the issue that what Zadokite Judaism represents to us 
is this idea of the temple as the, sur- the source and as the center of, of, of Torah law. Uh, this is the establishment of the, the temple, because remember, if you look at the history of Israel, uh, if you look at the prophets, what do they always complain about? Is that the people are continually sacrificing at the high places, at the Bamot, that were the high places that the Canaanites would offer their sacrifices to. So there's a syncretism involved, right? People are worshipping Hashem, but they're also worshipping Baal, they're also worshipping Asherah, they're worshipping fertility cults, different gods, and so forth. There's always this confusion. When Ezra, come back, when Ezra comes back, he says, no more, we're not going to do that kind of stuff anymore. By imperial law, only Jerusalem will be the source of sacrifices of Korbanot. Only they will be tolerated. And the law shall go forth, if you will, from Jerusalem, to, to quote one of the prophets. Now, Zadokite Judaism uh, emphasized the priority of the priest. Um, and if you look at everything about the temple itself, if we, were, we don't have to go back to it, but if we were, if we were to go to the, uh, the picture of the temple itself, the second temple, you have the inner sanctum, you have the, the next court where the korbanot are done, you have the outer courts, then you have a greater court. This idea of descending levels of kedushah, of holiness, is a key element of the Zadokites. They believed that God had ordained the high priest, the, the Kohen Hagadol, as the individual in whom the highest level of Kedushah rested. And then, of course, what happened is the next behind him were the Levi'im, and then behind him were the Israelites. And even in that order, there were you know, different orders because there were Mamzerim, there were people who were bastards, if you will. There were Netanim, individuals who might have been descendants of the Gibeonites and so forth that may have had different status. There were, of course, there were servants and slaves. There were non-Jews. And as you go forth from the temple, the, the uh, aspect of holiness decreases. Even the animal kingdom, of course, has a di- uh, differing levels of holiness. Why? Because we have unclean and we have clean animals. So everything is about order. Everything is about everything has its place. And we have to follow the Torah as it has been prescribed. Now, one of the first issues that Ezra contends with is the issue of what? Intermarriage. And this is why I mentioned the issue of matrilineal descent in the very beginning, because he returns and he says, I have found people and even among the priesthood who have married individuals or or women from the tribes that were prescribed by the Torah itself. And what happens, the Torah, uh, not the Torah, but the book of Ezra and Nehemiah tell us that the mothers of those children had not taught their children Hebrew, but they spoke in the language of the, the mother's lineage. And it's interesting because if you look at it from a historical standpoint, um, mothers usually dictate the religious environment of the child. It's, I think it's, you could probably look at it sociologically. It's probably true. I don't think there's any issue of contention with that. So one of the things that Ezra and Nehemiah do, they say, this is intolerable. You will divorce those women and you will send those children away, which is very harsh. But from the standpoint of Ezra, we don't have any room to negotiate. Why? Because he believes that Hashem has pushed the tribes out of the land because of this very issue. Why? Because women, men, whatever, from other countries, from other nations, have brought in idolatry into the midst of Israel. And if you will, Israel must be, as controversial as it may sound, a holy race. We cannot have the influence of these people. So that is one of the demarcations that Ezra and Nehemiah established. We cannot have mixed marriages. Now, one of the other things that they do, and this is where I have the, uh, the arrow going up to Samaritanism, Samaritanism. If you remember, uh, there were remnants of the tribes in the north, but the Assyrians had also brought populations from other places and brought them there, and there was a mixture that came about. Um, they worshipped Hashem, but they also worshipped other gods, and they sort of had this synchristic relationship which had been problematic in the first era of the temple. So they approach uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and they say, hey, we'd like to build the temple. You know, we're, we're, we're kinsmen, right? you know, we're cousins. Would you let us participate? Now, Ezra says, I, I'm sorry, but we, we can't allow that. Because from his standpoint, again, this is the very issue that led to the destruction of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We cannot have individuals that are compromised, that are worshiping multiple deities, uh, whose lineage is in question, who are going to participate in the temple itself. So what happens in 2 Kings chapter 17 is you have a rift that happens and Samaritanism becomes its own line. Now today in, in Israel, I think there are something like three or four hundred Samaritans that are left. Um, I'm sorry? And she'll read, yes. And, and they continue. And, and they, I mean, if you, if you talk to them, they'll tell you, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a descendant of Israel. You know, they have their own Torah scrolls, which has some alterations. They have a Paleo Hebrew. They have their own priesthood. Uh, and some of them, of course, they, they do, uh, I think, a uh, Korban on Pesach. 
So they say we are the legitimate heirs because we never left, which is sort of an interesting argument, right? We never left the land. They also uh, uh, reported to Cyrus that the Jews were up to no good and they stopped the construction of the temple because of that. Uh, well, well, the walls. Uh, but, but what's interesting is, and that's an excellent point that, that Stuart made, is that this is the problem with the Samaritans. When the going is good, we're brothers with the Jews. And when the going gets tough, see you later. And that's the, that's the issue. Now, now the, what's amazing is that this issue is not resolved even in the times of the Gemara. If you look at the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud, the issue of Samaritan status still comes up. You can find it in the New Testament, right? The story of the Good Samaritan. These issues of conflict continue to resonate for centuries after the fact. And it's interesting because some of the rabbis will say, do you accept the, uh, a ketubah or a get that was signed by a Samaritan? And rabbi, one rabbi will say, yes, I accept it. And another rabbi will say, no, I don't accept it. Do you accept the, uh, if, if a uh, Samaritan slaughters, do you accept their meat? And one rabbi will say, well, in that mitzvah, they're, they're actually very meticulous. And then a rabbi will say, yes, but the problem is that with respect to non-Samaritans, they are not so guarded. So they are, you know, they're very guarded in terms of the mitzvot when it comes to them. But if, uh, you know, Mr. Jewish man comes next, they'll say, well, you know, this is Tarefa, you know, there, I'll just put it for you and, and I won't say anything. So there's this often issue of whose side are they on. During the Maccabean War, there's also that issue because they're sort of siding against Jews, they're with Jews. And so there's always this question, where are they? And, and as often as the case in Halakha, there's not necessarily a definitive standpoint. I mean, for the most part, it's, you know, uh, the rabbis don't accept them as Jews, but it's clear that they do have a claim to, to be Zara Israel, right? I mean, they're, they're the descendants, the seed of Israel. So they do have legitimacy there. And I think that's intriguing that they still survive to this day. So, so let's continue as, as uh, quickly as we can here, because there's so much information here. Now, I'm sorry? Oh, the door? Uh, no, no, we'll stay here. Uh, so now what we have is uh, the Zadokites have returned under Ezra. And if you look at Chronicles, you'll find that some of the priests, uh, there's an issue also in Ezra and Nehemiah, some of the priests cannot prove the le- legitimacy of their claims. They've lost their paperwork. They don't have their Brit Milan certificate. They don't have their ketubah. They don't have, they don't have their documents, right? Uh, I was talking about the importance of this to a group, uh, you know, about how important that is. So they know that they're from a priestly line. You know, their grandfathers, of course, have been exiles. But now that they're returning, they're like, I, I can't find my passport. I can't find my, my issue uh, that, that documents my status as a Kohen. So the issue is what will happen with them. And so what happens is that some of these individuals are basically sidelined because, you know, they can't have this, this uh, ambiguity as to who will be uh, serving in, in the Beit HaMikdash. So what we have is you have an individual, a group of individuals that are sidelined. They still participate in Jewish life, but they have lost their status as, as uh, Kohen because they, they're not, they can't be validated. And what, what scholars think is that they became, in essence, uh, another line that we find um, that I could have really connected to a sort of Enochic Judaism, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but in many ways, it's representative of what happens uh, among the Essenes. Later on in the, the Maccabean struggle, remember that we talked about the fact that the, the Hasmoneans displaced the Zadokite line. What happened to those individuals? They were pushed out. Some of those individuals went to Egypt. One individual, Onias, began a temple at Leontopolis in Egypt. Uh, others were scattered, and some of them were displaced and eventually, we believe, gathered at Qumran or among the Essenes, sort of as a counter group, right? Questioning the legitimacy of the temple in Jerusalem. So the temple in Jerusalem always has this issue. Now, one thing that we have to remember when we're going to talk about all these different movements is that the goal of all of these movements is to restore what was once in existence. So when we talk about the Messianic age, what is the purpose of of Mashiach? It's to restore the line of David, the fallen uh, sukkah of David, right? The fallen throne of David has to be restored. Well, in the minds of all of these different groups, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, yes, we had a catastrophe. The temple was destroyed. We're picking up the pieces and we are going to reconstruct once, what once was. But we are the legitimate heirs to biblical Israel. And I would contend that the rabbis following the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, and then especially after the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135 CE, they are doing exactly the same thing. The rabbis, uh, the, you know, sometimes I have people question, every, does everything that the rabbis say in the, in, the, uh, in the Gemara, is it true? And I said, it is true as far as they believe it to be true, 
But I believe that what they are trying to do is they are trying to envision and pick up the pieces of what has happened. The temple has been destroyed and they are putting together the documents and the traditions and the Masor that they have. And they are trying to put together the, you know, the, the jigsaw puzzle to the best of their ability because their expectation is that eventually when Mashiach comes, all of this will be restored and we're going to have all these pieces ready to put in place. But every one of these movements is doing the same thing. They say, hey, I have a legitimate claim. I am a Samaritan. I was here. My people are from the northern tribes. The Zadokites say we are the inheritors because we have legitimacy from Ezra, from Sadok, and from imperial rule. Um, and then we have other groups that eventually uh, come out, uh, like uh, the Essenes and so <coughs> forth. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, Enochic Judaism, and I'll talk about a little bit about sequential Judaism. So you're familiar with the book of Enoch, uh, probably, or at least you've heard of it. It's not included in the biblical canon. Uh, but there's actually a, an entire collection that is uh, called Enochic literature. The first is the book of Enoch, the first book of Enoch, uh, which was actually remnants of it in Aramaic were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Before that, we only had copies of it in Greek and in Ethiopic, because the Ethiopic uh, Orthodox Church is the only one that maintains it within its uh, canon of, of biblical text. Um, and, of course, it tells the story of Enoch, one of the patriarchs that ascended to heaven or was taken by God uh, after having lived 365 years, which is a critical number to remember. Now, there was also uh, a second book of Enoch. And then there's actually a rabbinic work, which is called Sefer Chechalot. It's a, it's a rabbinic work sometime from the 4th or 5th century. It's a very Kabbalistic work. Um, and it's very interesting because this issue of Enoch continues. Now, I forgot to draw a connection between Enoch and later Christianity, but Enoch proves to be a, a tremendous influence on the rise of early Christianity. So in Enoch, um, what's important to note is, is this. Um, the Torah is certainly uh, mentioned you know, very briefly, but that is not the uh, central point of the book of Enoch and that literature. The book of Enoch concentrates on the figure of Enoch, but it also concentrates on the cataclysmic event that it considers to have occurred, which is the fall of, the, uh, of what they call the Watchers. Uh, it's actually uh, a term that is used in um, the book of Daniel, in the Aramaic, I think it says Irin. It's one of the Watchers. They are angels. And in the book of Enoch, these angels descend, and you can actually surprisingly find this uh, in Talmudic tradition as well, uh, they descend, and what do they do? They take women, and they intermarry with them, and they produce progeny, which are what? Which are giants. They're demigods. Uh, now, most people often think that this is outside of the Jewish tradition, but it's not. As I mentioned, it's actually in, in, in the Gemara. You can actually find a Midrashim that discusses this issue, and Sefer Chechalot is specifically about the uh, ascent of Enoch. Now, in the mind of the readers of Enoch, the angels have come and have thrown everything into chaos because they've, they've crossed the divide between the heavens and the earth and they have rebelled against Hashem and they have brought evil into this midst. Now, of course, the Torah would say, yes, we have evil in our midst. You know, we have the fall in, in Gan Eden and so forth. But in the minds of the book of Enoch, we have a, a spiritual evil that is a much more uh, serious nature. And only a, a supernatural intervention can come about and uh, like put things back into place. And so when you, read the book, when you read the book of Enoch, what you find is that Enoch is presented uh, as almost this messianic figure. He ascends into heaven. He can go talk to the watchers who are imprisoned. Uh, he's able to converse with God. Hashem clothes him in beautiful raiments and clothes that are angelic. He's transformed essentially uh, into a god, if you will. And he serves, believe it or not, a salvific role. He is a Messiah sort of in waiting. And so what happens is you have that idea very closely mirrored within early Christianity. And in fact, if you read the New Testament, again, from a historical standpoint, uh, the book of Jude, Second Peter, other references are, are, are included. Second, uh, Jude specifically refers to the book of Enoch. Now, the fact that we find it at Qumran tell, and many copies of it, tells us that it was very popular among people at that time. Um, and we also find, uh, there's also the, the, the Book of Giants that is found at Qumran, which discusses the, the, the giants that came after and they're destroyed by the flood. Uh, we also have other books like uh, the Book of Jubilees that was very popular again at, at Qumran, and it talks about the fallen uh, angels and the flood and all these kinds of things. So it was, a, it was a tradition 
that was very widespread. And you can see the remnants of it if you look closely uh, in rabbinic tradition. It comes back in the medieval period much stronger. Uh, there's a work that is um, Me'am Loez, uh, a famous uh, Sephardic work that was written in the 16th century in Ladino, in Judeo-Spanol. Uh, and it references that tradition as when it does commentaries on, on the, uh, the book of Genesis. Um, so the issue, the, the reason that I mentioned that is because what I'm trying to say is that they have a different emphasis than the Torah. So the Torah is there, but their emphasis is on some kind of a supernatural intervention, sort of this apocalyptic, you know, end of times, if you will, uh, intervention that will take place. And you find those ideas later among the Essenes and among the, the community at Qumran. The Essenes in the community at Qumran believed that the Zadokites had gone astray for various reasons. Now remember that I mentioned 365. So what we have here is one issue is a differentiation or debate about the calendar. Now the Torah stipulates a calendar that is both lunar and solar, right? We have to calculate because it tells us you shall observe in the seventh month uh, in, or you know, whatever month, the first month in the spring or however it puts it. And if you don't if you don't do both calculations, you'll wind up like Islam, where you have a rotating, uh, you know, celebration. So it's clear that it's a lunar uh, uh, solar calendar. But remember, the Torah is not disseminated fully, so people don't have access to that. They have their own traditions. And what Enochic Judaism places emphasis on, because there's a book called the Book of Astronomy or the Astronomical Book in the Book of Enoch, because it's really five works put together. It emphasizes the solar calendar. Now, what happens if you follow a solar calendar? You're going to be celebrating Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah. All the holidays are going to be on a different day than the rest of the community. So what you have is you have a break between yourselves and the mainstream of the Jewish community. Now, if you think that is outside of the rabbinic tradition, you can think again. Because what happens is we find that I think it's Rabban Gamliel, and I can't remember if it's, if it's Rabbi Eliezer, this issue of the calendar is still an issue. Now, it's an issue for different reasons, because remember, when the, the temple was still in existence and the Sanhedrin was in, in, in uh, operation, witnesses would actually come and they would, they would have like a little uh, drawing and they would point to how they saw the moon. If it's a little sliver, is it full? And the people, because the people might be illiterate, right? And they might not be able to describe their farmers. So they would point and then after you know, two witnesses, they would say, OK, now this is the date and now we can send... You know, we could light the fires of Gondor and all the, uh, the communities will know that it is, uh, you know, the, the, the new month is, is dawning. But what happens after the Sanhedrin is destroyed, the temple is destroyed? That, that fixed point of reference is no longer there. And so we have these issues of debate again. And so I think, again, if, I think it's Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Rabban Gamaliel. Gamaliel had a dispute about when is Yom Kippur. So they were having this issue even in their time. Uh, in the second century, and Gamliel, I think it's Simon bin Gamliel, he basically tells him as, as the Nasi, the head of the, of the restored Sanhedrin, I'm gonna, I want you to pick up your mat and I want you to come on this particular day. And what he's doing is he's telling this rabbi, uh, you, by picking up your mat, you are transgressing the day that you believe to be uh, Yom Kippur, and you're showing your submission to the high court. So these debates continue, and it's really not settled, I think, until something like the third or fourth century. Hillel II, because these issues are of paramount importance. But you can see how, if you go further back in time, the central authority is not as definitively established. So we have this conflict, and, and so you have breaks right between different communities. Now, I put Hellenistic Judaism uh, as its sort of its own element. Um, it, it's very complicated because there's a debate. There used to be a debate among scholars that Jews that were living in the land of Israel, remember that there are three central points of existence in, uh, by, the, by the late Second Temple period. You have the, the Jewish community of, of Egypt, uh, centered around Alexandria, uh, and some North Africa as well. You have uh, the land of Israel itself, Judea, Samaria, the Galilee. And then you have a huge community in Babylon for all the Jews that did not return. Uh, in Alexandria, there may have been perhaps a, a million Jews in, in its vicinities, its territories, maybe another two million Jews in the land of Israel, another maybe another million Jews in, in the land of, of uh, you know, present-day Iraq and so forth. Um, so the idea that many scholars used to have is that if you lived in the land of Israel, you were sort of insulated from Hellenistic influence or from Persian influence and so forth. And the, now the new stream is basically to say everybody was Hellenistic. It was impossible to not be affected by Hellenism. If you think about the, the Hasmoneans, when they take power, the great issue is uh, Hellenism, right? Forced Hellenization, worship of, of uh, uh, Greek gods, 
uh, being uh, uncircumcised, you know, eating uh, uh, unkosher food, etc. And yet, within a couple of generations of the Maccabees, what will we find? We find uh, names like Aristobulus and, uh, you know, all these guys, you know, what their fathers had fought for. I'm not saying that they had sold out, but they had very easily adopted uh, Hellenistic ideas. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's interesting that it, it's, it's, it's inevitable. And you can see, I think you can make the argument that even within the rabbis, there is an element of influence. I, and, I, and I think I mentioned that in the topic of the lecture of Jewish thinking, where the, the systematization, you know, the, the, uh, the classification of different topics is something that sort of naturally comes about, but it's probably an influence from Aristotelian thought. So nobody is, is really uh, devoid of this influence, but we do have writings that are specifically Hellenistic. We have someone like Philo, Judaeus of Alexandria. He wrote a huge, massive book, which was only preserved by the church. Uh, the reason for that is because many of the topics that he talks about were considered to be very Christian. But I think we're sort of there's a bias there. We have to be honest about sometimes how the Jewish community responds to certain things that it feels uncomfortable with, because the reality is that during this, the Second Temple period, there was a very great diversity of thought. So uh, Philo uh, is a very devout Jew. But in the way that he communicates, he's very, uh, he's a Platonist. He talks about Plato. Uh, you know, the way he communicates, he talks about the Logos. The Logos is important because if, if you're familiar again with the New Testament, you have the Logos becoming is the Word, and the Word becomes flesh. So you have that idea, and people often have traced it back to the Logos. But if you think, if you look at the Targum, the Targumim, the Aramaic translations of the Scripture, of the Torah in particular, you have the concept of the Memra. With the Memra is, is the Devar Hashem, the word of Hashem. So Philo is not necessarily pre, a precursor to Christianity, but he is communicating in the way that he can communicate best. And so when we read it, it seems very odd at first glance because it seems so foreign to Judaism as we understand it today. But during that period of time, he was, if you will, as completely legitimate or as completely illegitimate as anybody else would be legitimate or illegitimate. Uh, so we have somebody like him that's represented by uh, Hellenistic Judaism, uh, sepential Judaism. Remember, we have works like the book of Proverbs, the book of Job, uh, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Uh, if you look outside of the scripture, the biblical canon, uh, the Tanakh, you can find Ecclesiasticus, the wisdom of Sirach. Uh, you can find, um, uh, I think some people classify second Baruch as well, which is part of the pseudepigrapha. Uh, in those uh, works, especially like Proverbs, think about it. It talks about wisdom and knowledge that is universal, right? Listen to your mother, listen to your father. Don't go with women of the street, you know, prostitutes. Don't bow before kings. Be, you know, don't swallow whatever they tell you because they're just there to, you know, for their own good. It's wisdom that you could find in any culture. And in fact, many scholars have gone about looking for parallels, and you can find many parallels. Now, the law, the Torah, is spoken about in Proverbs and in other texts, but it's not the emphasis. It's wisdom. Chokhmah is the, uh, like the ultimate expression of God's revelation. And so what scholars think is that there were individuals who, yeah, they were loyal Jews. They went to the temple. They, they, they gave korbanot. But their emphasis was on this universal aspect of God's revelation. So they didn't emphasize the Torah as much as we would think that they would have. And so we sort of put them in their own category, because if you read the book of Kohelet, what does Kohelet say? He's very skeptical, right? If I, you know, I see the righteous die young, the wicked live long and prosper. You know, what is it? It's all not, you know, basically it's all nonsense. What are, you know, it's a very depressing book. You know, I used to read that when I was young and unmarried as a picker upper. And I tell you, it didn't work. It's just, it was. But, you know, and at the very end, he adds, but the keeping of God, the fear of the Lord and the keeping of God and his commandments or something like that. Right. That's the most important thing to keep his commandments. Some scholars believe that those last lines were added because it sort of justifies the skepticism of all the texts, because he's sort of being honest about the complexity of life. But then at the very end, like the saving grace is that the th most important thing is to fear Hashem and to keep the mitzvot. So it's, it's, this is the reason that we draw this idea that they're like not putting the Torah as a central uh, um, focus of, of Judaism in, in their particular view. Yes, absolutely. It's not that last line that some believe was added later. Who knows? But is that not in fact what Jesus was talking Negative stuff, but then at the end, they put in the positive as though to remind people to focus on God's 
No, that, that's certainly that is certainly uh, a possibility, and I don't think uh, I think in the prophets it's maybe uh, because of the way that they speak, it's it's much more, if you will, God focused, if you will, for lack of a better term. Uh, I think Kohelet, it's it's a uh, it's the skepticism of middle age or I don't know middle age crisis, that kind of thing. But uh, but I, I I certainly understand what you're saying, and I think that's certainly possible. But um, it's a very different work, you know, than we would what we would see in in the the Torah itself in the first five books. Um, so let's talk about the others because I'm going here uh, pretty quick. Um, so we don't know exactly when the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, came into being. We know that during the Hasmonean era, they were already in existence. Now, the question is, were the Sadducees an offshoot, as the name sort of implies, of the, the Sadducean priests that continued? Now, eventually they uh, become priests themselves, or at least they, they, they're, they're able to take control of the, uh, of, of the temple. But we know that there were very stark differences between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now, the persons that we have to depend on for this uh, are three primary sources. We have Josephus, of course, the, uh, in his Antiquities of the Jews. He uh, lives in the first century. He fought in the great Roman Jewish war. And like the Samaritans, when things got tough, he said, I'll see you later. And I'll jump over to the Roman side. Uh, we have the New Testament, of course, where these two uh, pop up quite a bit. And then we have the, the Talmud which discusses them, obviously biased, uh, as all texts are biased, in favor of the Perushim, although it does have some negative aspects to add. Only one rabbi that I remember, I think it's Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, is actually identified as a Pharisee. And it makes sense because he's living at the time of the destruction of the, of the Second Temple, 70. He makes it out. And so he's sort of that last link, if you will, between the old order and then the, the proto-rabbinic and, the, and now the rabbinic phase of, of, uh, of leadership in the Jewish community. So there was a stark difference between the Pharisees and the uh, Sadducees. We don't know if the word uh, Pharisee is derived, from example, from parush, which might, you know, like a like darash, like to, to extricate from the text, to interpret the text. Uh, there may be some other uh, derivations of it. But we know that they formed sort of a, uh, like a fraternity that had religious and political aspects to it. So for the most part, the Pharisees were fine as long as they were allowed to observe Judaism undisturbed. So they weren't necessarily looking for the restoration of an independent kingdom as long as they were able to practice Judaism uh, in accordance with their views. Now, what's interesting is that uh, Josephus tells us that in the first century, the three major groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes, constituted very minute uh, uh, very small numbers. The Sadducees probably had something like four or five thousand. The uh, the Pharisees had something like six or seven thousand, and the Essenes had probably another, you know, four or five thousand, something like that. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's very minor. They're all under ten thousand. And if you think about it, in a population in the land of Israel of two million people, uh, a few thousand is nothing. It's it's really how much control, how much. Um, uh, not pressure, but influence that they, they usually wield. Uh, think about it today, uh, you know, what, what is it? The Dallas Metroplex has something like, what, 50,000 Jews, 60,000 Jews, something like that. How many rabbis are there in Dallas Fort Worth? Maybe 50? I don't know. Something like that. And I always tell people, uh, how much influence do the rabbis really have? And I said, I ask that all the time. And I, I'm very well aware of <laughs> how, how limited, you know, uh, the influence can be. But so you, you, sometimes we sort of overplay the importance. But what's important is, is that they have, um, in particular the Pharisees, they have uh, moral persuasion, right? They don't necessarily have the ability to dictate, but people uh, revere them and they sort of uh, look to them as the protectors of an ancient tradition, right? They are the ones who safeguard this idea of a Masora. And so that, uh, even though they're not impl- able to implement it like... Uh, 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 without any uh, opposition, they have sort of the moral uh, support of the majority of the people. At least that's what Josephus tells us. And so we sort of look to them as the progenitors of, 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 the, of the rabbinic movement. Um, Excuse me. Yes. No, absolutely. I may be mistaken. Um, I thought I heard you say that the Sadducees were the ones who The Sadducees? Yes, eventually they uh, are composed primarily of priests, but they also had other individuals that were part right. of them. Okay, so that being the situation, since the priests were in the, you know, holy da 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 um, it surprises me that the 
Well, and this is, uh, you can say Pharisees. It's, it's, uh, what I'm trying to do is say Judaisms, you know, Pharisaism, Sadduceeism, because I want to represent them as their independent uh, movements of, the, of their own accord. But, like, my surprise was that there would not also be an error from the priestly group as well as the ones that were more keeping the um, Torah intact with regard to how you follow it. Well, well, I would say that from the perspective of the Sadducees, we only have a, a few minutes left. Um, they are legitimate, right? They're saying, hey, we're keeping the, the original way that it's done from their standpoint. The issue has to do over, if you will, the beginnings of the oral tradition. The Pharisees have sort of the beginning elements of that, the notion of an oral Torah. They don't call it that yet, but they have the traditions of the elders. The, the Sadducees say, well, we only recognize the Torah and the, the traditions that they accept. It's almost like a, that's why the Karaites... Uh, claim that they are the uh, the spiritual you know descendants of the Sadducees, because they only adhere to the written text and inevitably to the tradition that they hold that interprets that text. The Karaites, the Karaites, uh, Karaite Jews uh, that that occur much later in the eighth century, uh, political issue and some other issues. But the the issue is over how the the Torah is interpreted. So both of these groups, they all are are loyal Jews, if you will. But their way of approaching the Torah is different. And sometimes the Sadducees have to bend to the will of the Pharisees. And sometimes the Pharisees have to sort of hold their own. Because remember, uh, by the first century, uh, the Romans were really the ones who were in control of the priesthood. And the priesthood at, at the highest levels is bought and sold. Uh, and so this is why we have these multiple groups in contention with each other. The way the Torah is being kept. The synagogues themselves are not really being run by the Pharisees. They're sort of these sort of communal centers, if you will, the early Jewish community centers at the time. And so you have all these different uh, groups and entities that exist side by side, and everyone is sort of crying legitimacy, uh, and, and you know, we're the legitimate heirs of, of the ancient tradition. So they're all in tension with one another, they're political issues, and then eventually, of course, there are offshoots of these, and that's why I put these, uh, the dotted lines into to Christianity. Well, um, I don't know that there was a direct influence from the Sadducees to the, the rabbis. I don't see that. Um, but I think inevitably, you know, all these ideas existed on, on one table, right? And so, you know, you might be able to make a case for some of the, the views of the Sadducees having existed uh, past the temple. Uh, but, you know, I, I haven't looked at that specifically. When we focus, it's always on the Pharisees the, as the basis for later halakha. Um, yes. The, the, my understanding is the Sadducees and the Essenes were strictly the written Torah, and priestly community and the Essenes didn't think the Zadokites were religious enough, and they went off and formed their own sect and had their own community. Well, the uh, Pharisees believed in the oral law, okay, which was antithetical to the Sadducees and the Essenes. So. That they became the inher- what we are today is due to the Pharisaic movement. Holding on to the oral. Well, oral and written. And in, t- in fact, if I may, the Sadducees and the Essenes were much more uh, authoritarian and halakhically very strict. The Pharisees, the most Pharisaic Orthodox person, was not as strict as the least uh, Sadducee or a uh, scene. Okay. Am I correct in that? Well, or am I oversimplifying? Well, I would make one comment regarding the Essenes and Qumran because they do have their own halachic literature. Right. Uh, so I would say uh, they didn't accept the Pharisaic model, right. but they have a very strict, uh, you know, they, they're very strict, yes. and, and, and it's really from, the, uh, from Qumran that we see the beginnings of halachic discussions and debate. So I think they would have, I would say that they would have considered the Pharisees to be the liberals, if you will, That's in that saying. sense. Yeah, they were that hardcore. The uh, most observant, yes. strict, halachically Pharisee was not as strict yes. as the least observant scene of such a gradation could be made. Exactly. And, and uh, I think you can't tell, but there's also 
a dotted line here, when you look at Qumran, and then I'll, I'll stop there, um, you see a lot of the same um, terms and ideas that are reflected in early Christianity in Qumran. Almost exactly, even the same phrases that are used. So it's, it's fascinating to me how you have all these movements moving and they influence everything that comes after that in, in the following centuries. Yeah, and, and I think you, you find that even, uh, especially in those first few decades, you see that it is, uh, what I'd like to talk about is, uh, if you look at Rebbe Nachman of Bratislav and, the, and, and uh, of course, a lot of Chabad messianism, it's sort of like that. I mean, if you look at the, the, the teachings of Rebbe Nachman of Bratislav, uh, if you look, there's a book called The Seventh Pillar. If you read that book, you, if you're familiar with Christianity, you're going to be shocked. It's like it's like somebody's copying somebody, and it's like it's really amazing because, and the reason I mention that is because it sort of helps you put that like time travel and think these are the ideas and that because there's not just one one messianic movement there's many right everybody's competing it's the same thing Torah oral tradition mess, messiahs and so forth so it's a very it's very complex that's sort of the underlying issue so um, so I'll stop there if if we want to make any comments complaints. Uh, <laughs> Oh, there's like there's like 40 slides on that, and each one of those slides. Can can I show one thing real quick? Just uh, if you could go down. Take 10 or 15 more minutes, Oh, so I just wanted to show you this. So this is uh, this is a whole discussion in of itself. So um, what we're trying to do here, and Gabriele Boccaccini, there's an amazing school of Italian scholars. They're all academics. Uh, they've done a tremendous job. So this idea is, is basically to show us what some literature was written under different movements. So for example, remember I talked about sequential Judaism, the wisdom literature, yeah. Proverbs, Job, Jonah, Kohelet, uh, Zadokai Judaism, obviously Ezra Nehemiah, that's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, remember, if, if, depending on how you look at Ezekiel, uh, the it might be a third temple that might be talked about, maybe the second temple, depending. But in any case, uh, is, who is essential to Ezekiel? The Zadokites. They are going to be there in this, you know, future event. Uh, the priestly writings, if you accept sort of a documentary hypothesis of the Torah, uh, Chronicles certainly conveys that idea. Uh, Hellenistic Judaism, we often, you know, the Septuagint was a Jewish book. You know, we sort of look at it sort of now as a Christian work, but it really is it's an authentic Jewish work uh, along with the Targumim. Um, and uh, uh, we sort of, and in that sense, I think we should be grateful to Christians for having preserved the Apocrypha. And some elements of the pseudepigrapha because they're really they're very Jewish works. Uh, of course, you know if it wasn't for the apocrypha, we wouldn't have first and second Maccabees. So um, you know these these were uh, accepted. Uh, Demetrius and Arapanus are just examples of other Hellenistic Jewish writers that we only know because of, of the early church fathers who preserved these texts. They're not Christian; they just happened to preserve them for some reason. Uh, the Zadokites, Tobit, which of course is in the the uh, apocrypha. Uh, Sirach, uh, who is also in the Apocrypha, the Wisdom, the Ecclesiasticus. Uh, Baruch, I think, I'm not sure if it's included in the, uh, the Christian uh, Bible, but um, that we think might have been uh, done as a Sadducean work. Uh, and then the Pharisees, Daniel is, is usually among scholars considered to be a composite work because there's elements of it that are Hebrew, Aramaic, and it's sort of back and forth. So at least part of it may date from a much later time frame. And if so, it sort of fits in well with a Pharisaic model uh, of thought. The Psalms of Solomon, uh, one of them is, uh, uh, I think it's Psalm 18, is, is very messianic in the sense of, you know, the, the warrior messiah figure is presented in, in one of the clearest terms. Um, and then the Essenes, like I mentioned, remember, uh, all those works of under Enochic Judaism, they're found among uh, Qumran. So the, the astronomical book talks about the 365-day year, which corresponds to Enoch having lived 365, which, interestingly enough, uh, there's an individual by the name of Endumaranki. Uh, I actually wrote a book on that. I didn't bring it, called uh, Enoch Rising. Uh, there's a Babylonian and Sumerian figure called Emenduranki who parallels uh, the story of Enoch. Uh, 
Um, and then there's the Aramaic levy and so forth. So this is to give you like an idea of how these movements are producing liter- literature and how uh, that might explain sometimes what we feel might be differences in focus. You know, maybe put it a good way. So they are pre-exiliac uh, works, uh, or you know they're written in the midst of uh, Isaiah. Certainly, much farther back. So Jeremiah is in the midst of the temple being destroyed. So he's sort of pre this after temp- the second temple. So this is all from the second temple period moving forward. So that uh, most of the prophets would have been you know before the Torah and so forth. But uh, I'm sorry. no, 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 uh, no, no, no. Uh, that's And, well, and some of them don't believe in a Messiah. That's what, that's, yeah, many of them don't. And many of them believe in many Messiahs. The, the Qumran community had two or three Messiahs that they uh, believe would come, a priestly Messiah, a Davidic Messiah. Uh, there are other figures within Qumran that, are, that seem to be having different roles. And, and many, again, many of these ideas seem to be reflected later in, in Christianity, uh, and some of them are not. Other groups didn't have any expectation of a Messiah. So the, that, the, the, the board is, you know, the slate is clean in, in the sense of uh, there being many different ideas that were put on it. Well, that is a whole lecture in and of itself of uh, four or five hours. But I, but I, will, I will say this. Uh, believe it or not, I, I have a book on that too. Uh, uh, it's called, it's, I didn't bring it because sometimes I don't bring certain books because I don't know how people react. It's called uh, Judaizing Jesus and it's called Radical Jewish Views on Christianity. Um, and it's based on the experiences that I had at the, the Siegel College of Jewish, St- of Jewish Studies, Burtis Institute, uh, experiences with local rabbis. I don't know if you, any of you know Rabbi Hanan Schlesinger. He used to be the rabbi of uh, Sharia Tefillah, modern orthodox. Uh, rabbi Asher Lopatin that I studied with. Uh, rabbi Byron Sherwin. Many rabbis. And I talk about these individuals. Uh, in the 16th uh, century, which would have been the 1500s, uh, in a, a, a uh, Renaissance Italy, there were many rabbis, Rabbi Leon de Modena, and a whole series of Italian rabbis that continued for several hundred years uh, that, that had a very different view of Christianity. And what I talk about in that book is I talk about, obviously there are legitimate issues with Christianity. Uh, you know, obviously anti-Semitism is obviously the biggest one. But the rabbis of the, of, of the Italian peninsula had sort of a very complicated situation because they were living in the midst of Rome, uh, but they also had to contend with other issues. And when you read their writings, they are very forward-thinking uh, in the sense that um, where other rabbis would have regarded Christianity as, as blatant idolatry, they, they took a minority position and they tried to look for what they considered to be the positive elements. And so what one of them wrote, uh, I think it's uh, not Leon de Modena, but it's Rabbi Solomon de Modena. He actually argued, and it's, it's, it's very... Uh, it fits in with what the Rambam, Maimonides, had said. It's nothing new. He said that, uh, that Christianity, in essence, I'm not quoting my own book because I can't remember, but Christianity was spreading the Torah and the knowledge of God throughout all the nations. 
And that for that reason alone, we should view, we have, should have a positive view. That Hashem had created this movement, in essence, as controversial as that is, and that view was actually accepted by Rabbi Asher Lopatin, Orthodox Rabbi Hanan Schlesinger, and 50 other rabbis. There was a statement that was signed, I think, in 2015 or 16, which was an Orthodox response to Christianity. And if you look at it, they're all, if you will, kosher witnesses. Uh, what they say is this. The Vatican in uh, Vatican II in 1965, uh, and they have something called uh, Nostre Atente, I can't pronounce it, uh, and they have another document called The Irrevocable Calling of God. And it basically it states very clearly uh, that God's relationship with the Jewish people is ongoing, that the God's covenant with, with Israel is intact. And they don't understand it, though, though it's sort of interesting the way they word it, but they believe that God has an active relationship with the Jewish people. So 50 Orthodox rabbis said, you know what? You guys did that you know, 40 years ago, whatever. We're going to turn around because you made a, a critical issue. You made, you made a critical statement acknowledging, uh, because the, the issue of Christianity in the past has always been centered on supersessionism, right? The replacement of Israel. And once you replace something, then it's illegitimate. And then if it's illegitimate, then it has to be eliminated, right? So they said, we recognize this is a major issue for you guys to do, so we will reciprocate. And in the words of the Rambam, and also uh, and many of these rabbis that I have in, in Judaizing Jesus, they say, we... We can have uh, basically this relationship. You know, we have we have a common goal, right? Is is the the knowledge of God in in the world? Uh, yes, you can say ethical monotheism if you want to say that. Uh, but but it's a very positive statement. So uh, I was trained in that line by every. I looked at every rabbi that I have studied with. The rabbi that married me, uh, Rabbi uh, Chaim Beck, uh, was a friend of not this pope, but the one before. Of, was it Ratzinger? And uh, he actually went with 40 uh, delegates to the United States to the Great Synagogue of Rome and performed, because he was a beautiful, uh, had a beautiful voice, uh, for uh, Pope John Paul II. Uh, and so we were talking one day, and he told me, yeah, I have a relationship with Ratzinger, and we text, and we like buddies. And, and, and every person that I have talked to that I have studied with uh, has always had Byron Sherwin, who was my greatest influence at the Spurtis Institute. Uh, he was in the conservative movement, but of the old school. And he would go to the Archdiocese of Chicago whenever there was a new bishop or cardinal, and he would give a Devar Torah. And so he had this kind of relationship, and I was influenced by that. Um, and I think it's always, how do they say you draw more flies with honey or something like that? So I, I'm not, believe me, I am plenty aware of, of all of the theological issues and the historical issues and anti-Semitism. Um, and, and I always try to communicate that you know, to Christians. But... I think there's also this other side that we also have to consider uh, as an option, you know, so. And, and they don't. And these rabbis that I talk about, they don't. And it's not an endorsement, but it's a recognition. Yeah. But, it, but his word is getting out there, okay? Because I converted from Christianity to Judaism, uh-huh. and I recognize in the New Testament things that were directly from the Torah, of course. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Having said that, the um, and there's some place where it says. Um, I'm a spiritual Jew born into a Gentile family because raised up Christian, whatever, there was always something that was wrong (laughs) with the New Testament. I mean, it just, and there were too many disconnects, too, Mm -hmm. between the old and, I know you don't like old and new, whatever. But I think that Christianity can be, no. So, what, what was it that searched the last time? Uh, Marvel and uh, <laughs> DC Comics. Christianity to me was a stepping stone mm-hmm. to find. And I find many people like that. I find many people that I discuss this with, and, and it's always the same story. And my stepping stones were, well, I thank God for them, Christianity, Messianic Judaism, because I, you know, I thought Jews, Jews, devil, devil. And I didn't know there was a difference mm-hmm. between Messianic and whatever. So those two were my stepping stones, and when God was drawing me closer and closer to my people, 
he allowed me to know mm -mm, this is not right. <laughs> and I left. And when I finally joined our nation of Israel, it's like, <sighs> well, and and many um, you know many of the rabbis that I studied with, they would you know how I noted, well, this is in Jude or this is that. That's the way they talked. You know, they would talk in class. They were orthodox. They were very well read. And you know, so I sort of I use that frequently because it's, for me it's historical data and it's on the table, and I need to use it you know to prove whatever I need to prove. So I think that positive relationships are are good, and I think that and uh, in, in, in the end. Uh, you know, it's it's the uh, what do you call it? An animosity does not produce necessarily the result that we would like. So, uh, okay. <laughs>